our final speaker for this session is Professor David Back. Uh, Professor Back is Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Liverpool, um, who has done extensive work on antiviral research, including HIV and hepatitis, and more recently COVID. Um, he will take us through a hopefully uh, whistle-top store of uh, the past, the present and future of HIV treatment. Thank you, Professor Back. Thanks very much. It really is a great honour to be part of this symposium and daunting to follow two such outstanding talks. So my task is to go through a little of the past, present and future of HIV treatment, and that is my roadmap. It is the past, the present and the future. So the past, it, it, it was June 1981 which saw the first published case reports of a rare pneumonia among five men in Los Angeles. This was pub published by the CDC. Um, in the Mortality, Morbidity um, Weekly Report. This was followed up then by the New York Times one month later, an outbreak of rare cancer in gay men. And before the end of that year, we had headlines in the UK. And the first UK case was December 1981, 40 years ago. And Terence Higgins was one of the first to die from an AIDS-related illness in July 1982. So it's really poignant that today, December the 1st, is World AIDS Day, and it is 40 years since the first case was seen in London. It was 1983 that the discovery of a retrovirus was first highlighted by Francois Barzanuzzi, and then in 1984, a number of publications in Science about a retrovirus, a cytopathic retrovirus, which was then call, called HTLV-3. Uh, but drugs were only just beginning to be discussed. Uh, and it was 1987 before the very... Sorry, I'm one slide ahead of myself. So it was, it, it was 1987 before we actually had the very first drugs being discussed publicly. And they were nucleoside analogues, analogues of thymidine and cytidine, uh, and they were didioxycytidine and AZT. And AZT was then first approved by the FDA as the first AIDS medication, and that was in 1987, in what was then a record 20 months. The first clinical trial was published also in the New England Journal of Medicine, on the efficacy of AZT in the treatment of patients with AIDS and AIDS-related complex. And the data at that stage looked relatively promising. It was 24-week data, and you can see the difference in deaths between the placebo arm and the AZT arm, and also opportunistic infections. Headlines followed. So this was the headlines in the UK in 1987 with Princess Diana opening the UK's first unit exclusively caring for HIV and AIDS patients at the London Middlesex Hospital. And there were headlines which were good and sometimes not so good. And it is 30 years since the giant of rock, Freddie Mercury, died aged 45. And last week was the anniversary of Freddie Mercury's death. He died in London. But I want you now to go back just in time because we need to talk about the Liverpool connection. And Alistair first came to Liverpool in 1974. This was the first picture that I could find of the department um, in its 1977. Uh, and you can see Alistair pictured. On the top, your left, um, at the very far, is uh, Kevin Park, who some of you will know, with a lot of hair. And uh, I was next to Kevin. I joined the department, and Kevin had, uh, in the 70s, as very young lecturers. My interest was drug disposition, drug handling, uh, and pharmacokinetics. Kevin's was more in the adverse reactions of drugs. And we had lots and lots of fantastic discussions with Alistair about how we could move the, the whole research agenda forward. And it was always chemical to clinic, molecule to man. That was always his mantra, that we would have to have that kind of program which would take the lab um, science and then take it to the clinic. Now, the very first realization that we should start to work in HIV 
was in the late, seven, uh, late 80s, with AZT being uh, dominating uh, the agenda for treating, and clearly this drug um, had um, some advantage, but it was really short-lived. And there are a lot of things that we didn't know. So we started an in vitro program, a lab-based program, looking at how zidovudin was being handled in the body. And then we went to our first clinical trial, which was in patients looking at zidovudin pharmacokinetics and the effects of other drugs on zidovudin in the clinic. And they were both published in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. But Alistair's role became far more national and international in terms of HIV because there was the Clinical Trials Committee at the MRC, the Therapeutics Trials Committee, the ATTC, and Alistair soon became chairman of the ATTC, and I joined the committee and saw the expertise of Alistair in chairing uh, a, a committee of pretty um, dogmatic individuals at times, and he was able to synthesize the information and come to conclusions. So Concord was the first trial in the UK. Uh, it was linked to the French uh, ANRS. It was a randomized double-blind control trial of immediate and deferred zidocin in, in symptom-free HIV. The results were relatively disappointing and actually quite controversial as well. Uh, and the next trial was one, let's try two drugs rather than a single drug. That trial was Delta. It was a randomized double-blind controlled trial comparing a combination of zidovudin with another nucleoside reverse transcriptase compared to zidovudin alone. And you can see that Alistair was chairman of the uh, trials committee, um, bringing together, again, a grouping uh, both in this country and beyond. But the data were relatively disappointing. If you really drill down to what was happening with just a single drug, and you look on the left-hand side, and you can see, and that's a, a year window, the blue block, uh, you had a transitory decrease in the virus it stayed for a very short time, and then the virus returned. With two drugs, which we had in Delta, the decrease in viral load was slightly greater, slightly more prolonged, but it did not last. So overall, although we were excited at the time, the transitory nature of the effects of these early drugs is clearly seen. And they were also controversial. There was a lot of demonstrations against how can we be using drugs that poisoned people. And that was the mantra on this side of the Atlantic, on, on, on the other side of the Atlantic, in many countries. And you saw often these demonstrations, people are being poisoned from AZT. I remember discussing with Alistair, and I was drawn into a court case in South Africa of a patient who had died from HIV although the family thought he died from poisoning by AZT, and therefore the court case was against GlaxoSmithKline for allowing a drug to be a toxic drug, against the president, Thabo Mbeki, for allowing this drug, against the health minister, and against the clinician. And so this was in the high court in Johannesburg, and I was brought in as a defendant to defend the use of AZT from its mechanism of action. They were interesting times. My wife thought I would end up in Robben Island, I think, by going on this particular court case. But when you look at the pivotal times in HIV, it was 1996, uh, and that is the, the third block along, the darker block, which was highly active antiretroviral therapy when a third drug was added to the two nucleosides, and this was a protease inhibitor or a non-nucleoside. And I remember vividly being in Vancouver at the AIDS meeting, and the headlines in the New York Times was, we're now talking about life and not death in HIV. And the first clinical trial was published uh, with three drugs at that time as well. And you can see the impact. The impact was dramatic in terms of the annual deaths. So you can see this pivotal point of 1996 with the introduction of three drugs and the, the annual deaths, and this is the CDC data from the US, dropped dramatically in a short space of time. But there was a trade-off. And the trade-off was that we were using protease inhibitors. The dose of the, uh, the, the main drug was sequinavir. It was 1,200 milligrams three times a day. The tablets were 200 milligrams, so that was 18 tablets of sequinavir. 
plus the other drugs that a patient was on. And so the handfuls of drugs were absolutely true. This is what patients were taking at that time. And one way forward was, could we have a lower dose of sequinavir? And Abbott in Chicago had done some early studies looking at blocking the breakdown of sequinavir or a protease inhibitor um, in, so that it wasn't metabolized so rapidly and therefore you could give a lower dose. And we followed up the concept that came from the, the drug company and did the first clinical trial in Liverpool in patients giving sequinavir with another drug, ritonavir. And the lower line on this pharmacokinetic plot shows sequinavir given alone and if you gave it at the same time as ritonavir, you could get a 20-fold increase in exposure. And by doing so, by giving the ritonavir together with sequinavir, you could lower the dose of sequinavir dramatically. So this was the concept of boosting. And what it did effectively was that the white, um, the, the, the white block blocks the cytochrome P450 enzyme, which is metabolizing the drug, and allows far more drug to go to the protease and actually have the action of the antiviral. So this was a step change forward. And you can see that Alistair was pivotal. I remember the discussions. And this was the fastest track paper I think we ever remember. And I remember being in his office when it was accepted. And the, I think he even brought out the port or the, the uh, sherry or something. But we had a little drink uh, about this. But there were trade-offs with these drugs. And we can see some of the disease and drug-related adverse events and comorbidities. And they were multiple, some related to the disease, the HIV, some related to the drugs. And there's a whole smorgasbord of different uh, diseases uh, and comorbidities which clearly came into play. One of the pivotal studies then, which Munir and Kevin Park led out, was looking at a back of their hypersensitivity with the recognition that here was a drug that was causing in a small percentage of individuals a, a clinical phenotype of a rash. It was then discovered in the laboratory what the causal chemical was. It went on, to, uh, Munir and team went on to look at the clinical genotype, the association with HLA B5701. And, and this was then, in, in summary of a lot of work, shown to be cost-effective to be rolled out. And that yellow line shows the rollout of HLA B5701 genotyping. And it then went into guidelines. So here was a test which was very much going to be used across the globe uh, for a back of ear hypersensitivity. Another thing that Alistair and I discussed at great length was that these drugs were complicated for physicians to use because you had, you had boosted protease inhibitors and the ritonavir wasn't just boosting the, the, HIV, <coughs> the HIV drug, it was boosting the amlodipine and the statin and any other thing that a patient might be on. So could we get some resources to help clinicians? And initially we produced just some charts, for, for, um, which were little um, static charts. Then we went to a website, an interactive website, first in 2006. Then we went to a grade-based evaluations of how we evaluated all the drug interactions with an international editorial board. Then producing the um, various iterations of the website and apps. Went into hepatology, produced the same for hepatology. Went into cancer, produced the same for cancer, cancer, uh, cancer website and apps for drug interactions. And then last year, very rapidly, had to produce a COVID-19 website. Um, and this is updated on a weekly basis. And I've had two texts this morning saying two new drugs have been added this morning to the COVID website. So it's something which is constantly um, being um, moved forward. Um, and I hope... Um, we know they're in guidelines throughout the world, so it's useful. So if we look at Alistair's involvement, I think it was absolutely pivotal in the way that we developed our understanding of antiretroviral therapy. He had 60 HIV-related papers as author or as chair of the trial steering committee. So that whole phase from the time that AZT came through to the way that we had triple drug therapy and we started to see people able to um, now look uh, at, 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 a, at not, you know, not a death sentence, but this is 
this is now being able to live. And then there were other developments, of course, which in a sense moved beyond. Alistair went into far um, other, uh, greater other roles in nationally and internationally, and probably not so involved in the day-to-day -day running of the, uh, the, the studies in Liverpool. So where are we in the present? Well, in the present, we have a lot of interest in a number of targets for drugs, but the principal one is to use integrase inhibitors. They, they are drugs which block the integration of the viral um, DNA into the uh, host uh, DNA. Really important drugs which find their way into guidelines. These are guidelines for the World Health Organization, for the European and for the US DHHS and ISUSA. And I know it's all, uh, in, in a sense, it's abbreviations. I'm sorry about that. BIC means Bictegavir, DTG is Dolutegavir. They're very, very heavily um, uh, in, in the way of integrase inhibitors, either plus two nucleosides or plus one nucleoside. And when we look at their effects, you can see over to the right-hand side in the green, the effect of two nucleosides plus an integrase or one nucleoside plus an integrase, the viral load drops and is sustained. So we really do have highly effective drugs to drop uh, and maintain a decrease in viral load. So the present, the key message is that we have efficacy, which I think we have now reached a ceiling. It's very hard to do any better uh, in the future. So we have to have some other approaches. We've got multiple single pill combinations. When I look back to those early days of handfuls of pills, patients now take one pill once a day. And we're now looking at the first long-acting regimen, which is really uh, recently been approved. So our whole focus of treatment is very much patient-centered with choice, convenience, and tolerability. And we now have the good news that all the advances in treatment means that people living with HIV and on effective treatment cannot pass it on. So the message on World AIDS Day is U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. And we also, and I haven't really had time to go into this, have PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and the announcement in March 2020 that PrEP will be routinely available across England as part of the government's aim to end HIV transmission by 2030. However, the less good news is that of today, World AIDS Day, HIV remains a global crisis with 37.7 million persons living with HIV and 10.2 million, that is 27%, are not yet on treatment and that needs to happen. So the, finally, the future, where do we go in the future? Well, the future is very different to where we've come in a sense because now we're looking at long-acting antiretroviral therapy with multiple technologies for drug delivery. There's long-acting injectable, either intramuscular or subcutaneous, microneedled drug patches, subdermal implants, vaginal rings, oral long-acting with nanomedicine to prolong the window of taking oral drugs. Furthest along the line is long-acting injectable intramuscular cabotegavir and rolpivirine. We have two major clinical trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine, one in antiretroviral naive patients, one in antiretroviral experienced patients, and in those studies, the injection was one monthly, although we do have a two monthly injectable study as well, two, two monthly intervals, but it does have an oral lead in to make sure that the drugs will be tolerated when they're given by injection. And many of you will know that NICE, just two weeks ago, 18th of November 2021, approved the first long acting injectable HIV treatment uh, in the UK and the rollout is anticipated in March or April 2022 into clinics. There are things that we need to know. We need to know more about the long-term efficacy and toxicity. We need to know whether you do have to have that four-week oral lead-in. Is that necessary? What happens if a patient doesn't turn up to clinic and misses their injection? 
What about this, what's called the PK tail? Because after the last injection, you can detect drugs, and that's what the two figures at the bottom, you can detect drug for at least a year, and in some, particularly female participants, up to three years after the last injection. We need to determine how we're going to work out drug-drug interactions and then implementation. There are other exciting developments. This is a different mechanism of action. It's called a capsid inhibitor. And it's a, a drug which is given subcutaneously, lenacapavir. And this drug, at a dose of 900 milligrams subcutaneously, gives drug concentrations, the yellow line, above a target out to six months from one subcutaneous administration. Now, it is slow in terms of getting to its peak, and therefore, again, is there a loading dose or oral administration that will be necessary? There's another drug, is Latrovir, which is now being looked at for long-acting implants. So having an implant, the technology is the same as the contraceptive implant, implanon or nexplanon, using the same polymer. But if you look at the green, uh, the, the figure, the actual concentrations stay above target at a dose of 52 milligrams in an implant out for a year. And this is now being thought of as potential for PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. We have HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies as well, BNABs. Uh, human monoclonal antibodies able to neutralize a wide range of HIV isolates. They target the HIV envelope, and it may well be that they could be used in conjunction with antiretroviral therapy or used alone for pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis. I think finally the question is, will we have a vaccine? Now, that's been the mantra, an HIV vaccine, the world's best long-term hope for ending AIDS. However, every trial so far has had some degree of disappointment, and the latest one, which was reported in August 2021, showed that in 51 of 1,079 participants in the active vaccine arm, they acquired HIV versus 63 out of 1109 in the placebo arm. So really, there was very, very little difference, and the study was discontinued. And it certainly isn't for lack of effort, and uh, um, over 800 million US dollars were spent on vaccine research in HIV in 2019 alone. Now, the future is we want, to get, um, uh, we want to get London to zero. London is a fast track city. And this is an initiative of the, uh, the Mayor of London, NHS England, Public Health England, London Councils, committed to get this city to reach that goal by 2030. But we have to recognize that there are inequalities in the world as well. So finally, the legacy. The legacy of Alistair is huge in HIV research. If we look at the strategy of Liverpool's Faculty of Health and Life Sciences today, 2021, and going forward, then infectious diseases is one of those quadrants, as is personalised health. So it's a really big picture as far as Liverpool is concerned. And we also have the Centre of Excellence for Long-Acting Therapeutics, looking at both HIV, hepatitis and malaria TB uh, in terms of long-acting therapy. The legacy of Alistair is that very quickly colleagues were able to move from HIV to COVID, developing the Agile clinical trial platform, which was putting drugs into a platform trial, uh, and molnupiravir was one of those drugs looking at safety at different doses, and you know that molnupiravir was the first to um, get approval in the UK, and with Pfizer's Paxlovid, which is 89% effective in patients at risk of serious illness, the UK government having purchased a quarter of a million courses of Paxlovid, as the Secretary of State was saying yesterday. But this is a drug which is boosted with ritonavir, and therefore there are potential, in my view, and we're working on it very hard at the moment, for some drug interaction considerations because of the ritonavir. And with that, my grateful thanks um, for those who were able to contribute uh, in discussions for this talk, and a huge number of postgraduate students and postdocs who did the work and were involved in the 395 HIV publications that have come out from Liverpool, um, which Alistair started that whole thing. So I'm specifically and eternally grateful, and my heartfelt thanks to Alistair, physician, Scientist, educator, mentor, colleague, and I'm delighted and humbled to call him my friend.
in Jean, some of those dinner parties at Cree Cottage, Feathers Lane, Heswell, are memorable and will live forever. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Back. Um, that's truly inspiring and impactful work on HIV that yourself and Sir Alistair have done and the continued work that you do. So we're all very thankful. Um, do we have any questions for the four? Um, so, I, so I have a question regarding HIV treatment. Um, so we... I think the HIV pharmacology is really fascinating and thank you for going through all of that and um, in some respects it's it's easy to think that we're done because people are living longer and actually not dying from AIDS but dying from um, cardiovascular disease and other diseases um, but there are still barriers regarding sort of adherence um, to HIV medicines and um, what are your thoughts about that? So this is one of the real reasons, in a sense, the push for long-acting because of adherence to oral daily therapy. It's always a reminder, I have to take my pills every day. Yeah. It's a reminder I've got HIV. Mm. So if you can roll out um, having a two-monthly injection or even longer than that or something, you know, which is maybe a patch, mm. that's less of a reminder um, because we know that U equals U. That's a message that has to be got out there. Yeah. Um, so the whole adherence thing does drive forward a new agenda as far as HIV. We could never have foreseen that yes. 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So you're right, it is different. Yeah. But comorbidities now are a big issue because mm. patients are aging with HIV. Yeah. And so the comorbidity issue is a big issue. Okay. Um, and from one question from Malia. Hi, David. Thank you very much. That's a brilliant talk. Um, I'm not going to ask you about HIV, I'm going to ask you about COVID. Sure. <laughs> uh, and, and Omicron is on everybody's minds at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and we've got these new antivirals coming through. And if you look at the history of antivirals, you know, with HIV, hepatitis C, you know, it's always been the use of combinations to be able to prevent resistance of occurring. But clearly COVID is a different kind of disease, and you know, and you have to catch it early in order to be able to treat with antivirals. So what do you think is the possibility of having to use combinations and how would that, you know, how difficult might that be to be able to really deploy in clinical practice because you'd have to catch the patients early. Well, I think it's a challenge to have to catch the patients early, whether it's one drug or two drugs, in the sense that, you know, if, you, if, if we're talking about five days from the first symptoms and the, the whole ramification of having a PCR test and getting a GP appointment and all that. So I think there are, there are practical issues. We've had a lot of debate about do we desperately need to... This is a different... Every virus is different. So you talk about hepatitis B, we can treat it with one, we, with one drug. Hepatitis C is a combination. HIV is a combination. Logically, you would think that targeting two different parts of the, 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 the virus life cycle is better than one in order to stop potentially resistance. But I don't think we know that. And I think there's a lot of questions that we, we have to address around the one drug versus the two drugs. I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer, Minera. I'd be more interested, actually, what you think about that, because you probably thought about it more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? Yeah. You haven't said anything about the possibility of a one-off course of, of treatment that would eliminate HIV, which surely must be the holy grail. Yes, yeah, so cure, in a sense, has been the holy grail. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about a kick and kill um, strategy, which is to try and kick... You've got this latent virus. The problem is undetectable, yes, but it does not mean that there's no virus. You have the latently infected T cells. So if you could kick out that latent virus that, that is there and then kill it, that is a fantastic strategy. So far, it hasn't worked. Now, why it hasn't worked, we could debate, but there's been a lot of effort to try to have the, that kick and kill cure strategy. You know, we do have patients, interestingly, there's... there's a London patient who um, seemed to have been cured. Um, so you have the London patient, you have a Berlin patient, you have a South American patient. Why exactly they seem to have been able to kick out virus so you can't even detect it in a cell it is, you know, it's, that is, I think, something we need to, to understand more of. But you're right, sure. Okay.